And the sign from, that's a film from like the late 60s. And the interesting thing about that film was that Bruce Connor actually was born on a farm in Kansas, just like Dorothy. And that film is exactly about growing up on a farm in the 1960s in Kansas. Um, or even, yeah, 1950s, I think. And it, 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 so there's a lot of very personal material from, from Bruce Connor in there. It's about this boy who falls asleep in the beginning of the film and has a dream. And the dream is about a movement. You see like um, airplanes and, and um, trains and it's a very high speed. But it has a very sort of strange and sad soundtrack. It's like a, a well-known um, uh, piece of music from I think the 17th century that's very um, kind of sad and melancholic that goes uh, along with, with all of that. Um, but, you know, for example, we in included the uh, images of Walker Evans, for example, in the exhibition at the beginning. Some of those famous uh, images that uh, depict the uh, scarecroppers. And it was for me really this idea that, you know, that those images were kind of representing what in my mind living in Kansas around the turn of the century must have been like, even though those images were taken in the 19, late 1920s. Um, it felt to me that this could be you know, very much a representation of what the living conditions of Dorothy might have been. Um, and Walker Evans himself was writing about his experience going to the South and taking those photographs, really thinking you know, that he would have entered another world, almost like a time warp, where he was brought back like, into the 19th century, where people were living under conditions that he uh, thought were not actually existing anymore in the United States, without electricity, without running water, without the possibility of an education, and so on and so on. So I felt that was like a nice way of into actually coming into the show and, and, and beginning the narrative. So the works that were existing, none of those artists, you know, based the works on The Wizard of Oz, mm -hmm. but you just integrated them into it because it served the purpose of the narrative. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes it didn't really. I feel like I have sometimes my own <coughs> ideas with it. Like, we had the any Warhol piece in there that would show Jackie Kennedy uh, um, during the funeral of JFK. And many people ask me, what's this piece doing here? Um, and for me, you know, Jackie Kennedy was uh, almost like the grown-up version of Dorothy. That's very much like how I saw it. You know, two iconic female figures um, of American history and during the 20th century, and both going through some form of uh, uh, hardship during during their time. But at the same time, there was also something magical about about um, uh, Jackie Kennedy, um, which I feel like uh, is kind of maybe related to Judy Garland uh, and and her representation of. Um, Dorothy. And everyone who's seen the movie or actually read the book, um, you know, probably will, will agree with me that there's something kind of sad and melancholic about The Wizard of Oz. There's even something a bit spooky about the book, um, all in all. And I think, you know, some of those pieces were sort of like also um, alluding to that part and that idea of, of The Wizard of Oz. So this um, Jackie Kennedy looking at the grave of, or the funeral of, of JFK at that particular moment. And it's just like a very iconic photograph where you see her looking really sad with uh, this black outfit. Um, kind of felt like really appropriate for me. It was the first piece that came to my mind. And, and for a, a reason I don't really know, um, it seems like a piece that most people who came to the show didn't really were able to make the connection, which is fine, you know. Sometimes it's just the way things go. I think there was another question. What, I see your crop, this is sort of like a, you weren't curate conversations. I wouldn't really call them tools. What I would say is that they're, you know, elements that sort of like contribute to a, a larger something that maybe is only created really through the sum of all these different little elements in there, you know. And and in that way, um, I it, it's 
you know, cu curating basically is like a form of editing. You know, you create an index as a curator, and you follow that index, and that index guides you through what you make your selection based on. So really, a curating, a, a big part of it is about making selections and then creating this index and then following that. And here, The Wizard of Oz, the book, is sort of like the guiding principle, the index that we created. And based on that, you select works, you commission works, and you work with the artist on that, you know. So, but I guess every exhibition, in a way, is also always a bit of a mirror of the person who, who um, curates them, you know, like you see what I'm thinking at this particular moment about making exhibitions, about the art world, who are the artists that I'm in touch with or I'm looking at or I have just come across, you know, and I guess in my case that mirror, the exhibition as a mirror of the curator, is maybe a little bit more, it's less, it's, it's more in focus than maybe with other curators, you know, where it's maybe a little, little bit more unfocused. Um, but, you know, and I have had a lot, of, a lot of comments about this, you know, um, about are these ideas maybe a bit too strong, are they overshadowing the work of the artists, and things like that. But they, I mean, from my experience, it's always been that artists actually respond quite positively to those ideas because someone is actually there to uh, make sense of it all and bring it all together, you know, and, and, and sometimes also put works into a context that they have never been seen in and opening up a discussion about the works on a completely different level. I think there was a question here. Well, my question is simply just that um, so you can assure your critical imagination that you have to calibrate between an image of early 1900s Kansas and the time in which the book was written and the technicolor revision that the movie suggests that fundamentally changed the film history in essence. Um, did you find yourself moving between those two images or were you able to bring them together in some sense? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, you know, I really made an effort not to go too much into the movie because the movie is so overpowering and, and you know, there were people that, that said to me, oh, I didn't even know there was a book. You know, because everyone thinks there is this film with Judy Garland and you know, like one, when it came out, it was like the avatar of its day. It like, it was the first movie with like, you know, white screen and all these colors and music and it was really the most sensational thing that people had ever seen to that point. So I was kind of trying to not go really to that route and actually introduce some of the other things, you know, that the, the first editions, the fact that there are actually 15 other Oz books, which most people don't know, and, you know, going down that path, but, you know, not absolutely excluding um, the movie Isa. There was this little element where you saw the ruby slippers and next to the ruby slippers we had images of all the main characters in like little frames, you know, like the way people sometimes have them on their fireplace or whatever. Kind of saying, oh yeah, this is like family. We are so familiar with those guys, you know, they're almost like my uncle or my aunt or, you know, my cousin or whatever, who is usually in those type of pictures, you know. We grew up with those guys. But you didn't go back and relate to the, there's a book a few years ago about how Wizard of Oz was written as a political satire, like uh, Alice in Wonderland and Gulliver's Travel. Most fantasy is satire of some kind of like, You didn't go back and mess with that populist? No, no, I actually, you know what's interesting is that, that there was a there was a book written about the Wizard of Oz that really looks at the Wizard of Oz as a sort of political allegory. And that book, for some reason, has become really, really well known. And in many cases, people assume that this is what the Wizard of Oz is really about. But I went to Stanford University, which is just a couple of miles south from, from uh, the Waters, and went there and asked them to, for all the books that they had on the Wizard of Oz. And there's, for, you know, for the Wizard of Oz, you have a feminist interpretation, you have a Marxist interpretation, you have the psychoanalysis.